first of all, very slow. Hands relaxed, jaw relaxed. And the day abandoned, the business left behind, the thoughts that occupied you so frantically on the way out here, you can drop those right now. You can slow yourself down, which will marvelously, if you really do it, put you in a state of chaos. Marvelous, most welcome chaos. Because driving out here or during your day, you had all these wild thoughts, all these feelings surging up, taking you over, giving you something to think and feel and do. And so you felt, and I underline the word felt, you felt secure, purposeful, alive. Now, I have deliberately, one minute ago, tried to deny you the false feeling of life by which you have lived all day long. Try to see what's being asked of you. To sit here, physically relax, because even the body is so used to being tense and nervous, it doesn't want to obey the simple instruction to react, to relax because it feels like it's doing something when it's tense. So if you sit here, being receptive, maybe for the first time in a long, long time, maybe for the first time in your life, the first reaction will be one of discomfort. You don't want to relax. You don't want to be receptive. You want to keep your mind and your feelings surging ahead all the time, in order to feel, get this please, in order to feel that you are you. But you are a fake. I you said you're a fake. You're an enormous fake. You're nothing but a fake and you've never been anything but a fake. Something in you object to that? You say you're real? Why don't you stop lying? For heaven's sake, you come here meeting after meeting and lie to yourself and don't even know it. Because you're a fake, you pay the price. And because you pay the price, you're in love with the feeling of paying the price. You're a compulsive self-punisher, smiling all the time at the little children in your home or at your husband or out in public most where you're putting on your act. Never seeing the depths of your fear and sorrow. So I want to tell you a few things tonight that will help you to begin to see what a phony you are. Every one of you in this room, no exceptions, no exceptions. Some of you, some of you may be such complete phonies that you won't want to come back to this class. You will want to lie and protect your phoniness and pay the price for the rest of your life and collect around you phony friends who will tell the same lies that you tell and so you call the, your mutual lies the truth. And you go home alone and terrified. Someone mentioned courage at the beginning of the meeting tonight. Can you not have just, just an ounce of courage? That's all it's asked for you. The courage, look, to do one thing. To listen to what is going to be said tonight without reaction, without a negative reaction, without a response that says, 
I'll never understand that, or a response that says, I don't accept that. Try to see how you're reacting to everything that's going to be said here tonight. At the same time you're listening to me, it's quite possible for you to turn your attention to your own mind, to your own feelings, and see how you're taking it, which will be a very nice introduction to you to your own chaos, which is the beginning of self-honesty, which is the beginning of right self-examination, which is the beginning of getting rid of everything that has haunted every one of you here, every one of us here. You're haunted people, you know that, don't you? Yeah. You know you're haunted, don't you? You think the haunting is out there? It is out there, but it wouldn't be out there for you unless the haunting was also in your own system. Your haunting inside is what fears the haunts out there. And we're going to learn tonight and other nights how to get rid of our internal haunting so that when I see your terrified face, or your angry face, or your lonely face, or your depressed face. It doesn't say anything to me except one thing, that you are as I used to be before I worked very, very hard for a long, long time and found out that I didn't have to be a slave of anything. All right. There were a thousand people who said to themselves and to each other, we want to walk down the path of truth. We want to reach the cosmic castle at the end of the path where truth is the king. So they went to a wise man who was reputed to know the answers to the path and asked him, where it was and could they start and to tell them something about the path to the cosmic castle, the path of truth. So he said, yes, indeed, there is a path and it's not far from here, very short. You can start practically where you are now, just over there. But there are some characteristics of it that I'll tell you about so you'll sort of know what you're getting into. You can start, every one of the thousand of you, down the path of truth. All of you can start, but all along the way, every mile or so, as the path twists and turns, goes up and down, you'll see a sign right alongside the path. And when you come to it, please read the sign very carefully and then make a decision according to what that sign says. You'll understand what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, when you see the signs. So start your journey and remember that if you refuse to pass beyond any sign, then you'll just have to come back where you started and you'll never reach the cosmic castle where truth reigns and where you'll be authentically whole inwardly. So they thank the man and walked a short distance away, very short distance, they practically could start where they were. And they started down the path. And as the wise man told them, it went through uh, forests and jungles and over rivers and deserts and twisted and turned all along the way. So after a while they came to the first sign big large sign and they were very curious about it so they all paused and looked at it and the sign said abandon your wish for the path to be easy abandon your wish for the path to be easy and they looked at it and discussed it among themselves a little bit and a few people came up the sign and stared at it and got angry. They got angry at what they saw and started making critical remarks about the sign. 
Why, why should the path, it's saying here that uh, I have to do things, I have to do some work, I have to exert myself. Now surely God isn't going to make me do hard things. That sign must be a lie. I don't want anything to do with this kind of a path. I'll go out and find my own path. So a few of them turned around and left as the wise man had predicted they would do. The others were a little bit disturbed by it, being basically lazy, wanting to think only mechanical thoughts and let mechanical emotions run through them. They, they didn't like it too much, yet, yet they agreed to abandon the wish for the path to be easy. So they went on, and indeed, from that point on, it got a little rougher, got a little steeper, more rocks in the way, rivers to cross, which they weren't sure how to get across, but it wasn't too bad, and they managed to get across. And they went on for several more miles, and finally it came to the next sign. And the sign said, at this point, you must abandon your wish for what is popular in favor of what is right. You must abandon your wish for what is popular in favor of what is right. Now that's a little deeper sign. They had to think about that a little bit more. And so they, they had a discussion about it and they, some of them agreed that just going along with the ways of a sick world, of a deceitful world, of where money was uh, the most important thing no matter how you got it, and wanting to be honored and wanting to be flattered, that all that fell under the category category of wanting to be popular instead of wanting to be right, which, another way of saying that, instead of wanting to be a whole, free human being. That's a little tougher one. And again, several men and women came forward and started arguing about it. Some of them even said, that sign doesn't apply to me. I already know what is right. I already know what is right, so this uh, doesn't, doesn't have any meaning to me. So I'm going to go on. And the three or four people that said, I already know what is right, I'm going to keep on with the tra pa on the path, a very peculiar thing happened. Very strange thing that hadn't happened before. As they tried to pass the sign, there was an invisible barrier there that prevented them. They couldn't do it. And so this made them all the more angry, rageful, and all the other people who agreed to abandon the wish to be popular, they looked at this small group of hostile people, and they were, they were very much surprised, and yet enlightened by seeing that all, all these people who were so friendly before this journey, they were actually devils. They behaved like devils. Boy, what a revelation you run into on this path going along with other people. You see how, how fierce they can be, how evil they can be. So those who didn't want to abandon the wish to be popular and accept what is good and true, they turned around. They had to. They were forced to. There's no compromise. They were forced to turn around and go back to the starting point. The others who agreed to abandon the wish to be popular went on. And again, the path became harder than it was before. But they wanted, they wanted to keep going. They wanted to see what it was like at the end of things. On and on, finally they came to a third sign. And the third, third sign said, very baffling to them, the third sign said, you must, you must drop your fear of evil. Oh, wow, things are getting tougher. Let's see, what does that mean? It says I must abandon, leave behind my fear of evil. Well, let's see. Let's see, they had a little discussion. Maybe we can understand this. Let's see, evil is anything that hurts someone else. Evil is anything that keeps me divided in conflict and contradiction. Evil is anything that makes me nervous. Evil is anything that keeps me ten tense. Evil is anything in which vanity plays a, a large part. I must give up my fear of that. That word fear kind of throws me. All right. 
to the best of my ability, I will give my, my fear of my own evil and the evil of other people. As best I understand it, I will obey the sign. Having agreed to that, even not, though not understanding it fully, but agreeing to investigate, explore it, a willingness to understand it, they found that the invisible barrier that had kept the other people behind enabled them to go on, while still others who didn't want that, who didn't want to even study it, examine it, decided to go back. They were discouraged. They said, this is too hard. I'm going to find an easier path. So now the group had been cut down to maybe just a hundred or so out of the original thousand. They went on and on and on, the hundred remaining. And they came to a fourth sign. And the fourth one said, at this point, you must discover for yourself what you must leave behind. Oh, oh, good heavens. Oh, how, how, how nice to have had all those previous signs which we didn't appreciate. And a lot of them looked at that sign and said, I don't want to work that hard. I don't want to go on if that is what is required of me. The others, a few others, a dozen others, let's say, <coughs> decided that they're willing to make the effort to see what is going on inside of them and outside of them that they had to detach themselves from in order to go on. The rest went back. They couldn't pass beyond because they weren't willing to leave it behind. The others went on. And they went on and on. And the few remaining, the dozen out of the thousand, finally stopped and had a little group discussion among themselves. And they all knew, without telling the other person, that the path, wherever it took them, was the most valuable, most beautiful thing in life. They knew, they knew no matter what they came to, what they ran into on the way, nothing was ever going to keep them from pursuing the path until they came to the end end of it at the castle of truth itself, cosmic castle of truth itself. And so in the discussion, one of them brought up the point as follows. It's very interesting, he said. Uh, the more we travel, the, the harder it becomes, and yet it becomes easier and yet harder because more is required of me. In other words, when I meet something that I have to abandon, I've found the wish for flattery in me, the wish to be, to be uh, told how great I am. Now, I can see that I have to abandon that, and that, that's okay, I can do that, but I find out that every time I give something up, ooh, that was something easy to give up. At the time, I thought it was very difficult and very hard. So, the farther I, we go, the more is required of us. But have you ever noticed, all of us here, the 12 people left, have you ever noticed, regardless of what happens, our step becomes lighter? And we're getting authentic encouragement that, it, that I don't have to work for it all. Authentic encouragement, courage, cosmic courage, that I don't have to work for at all. Because they're very, very real knowledge that I'm on this path that is taking me from where I used to be to where my heart really wants to be. That is my courage. And I know that nothing can touch that. Oh, sure, there are going to be obstacles. As a matter of fact, they agreed among themselves. I'm going to, I'm going to so carefully search inside of me to see these very, very remote corners that I didn't want to see before. I'm going to bring that up <coughs> to the surface so I can see ab and abandon that and go faster along the path. So 
we're going to leave our travelers, those who will endure unto the end, we're going to leave them traveling, conquering obstacles every day, and go on to another illustration, another story, in which you, the audience, will have to do a little work yourself, either after the break or when I finish the second illustration, because I want to bring everything that I've said up to this point down to practical matters. And I want you to try to figure out what these two men that I'm going to tell you about had to abandon, had to leave behind. See, now you have to do a little work when I'm through with the following. There was a famous lawyer, we'll call him Lawyer X, world famous. He, his name appeared in the paper and he commanded high fees, $80,000 a case, one of the most famous lawyers in the land. Widely respected, he was asked to speak at bar associations and everybody knew him, wrote his biography, bestseller. And although he was famous, uh, the best was yet to come for him. One day he was given a famous, notorious criminal case in which he defended the criminal, the Brighton Strangler. And at the end of this case, which he won for his client, the world was his. Every, he was an international celebrity rich, famous, everything was going perfectly for him. And as he walked out of the courtroom having won his case, the crowd surrounded him, the newspapers, the uh, photographers took pictures of him, the newsreel cameras, and he was on the six o'clock news. And he got in his car, and one of his assistants uh, asked, told the newsman, no more questions now, please. And his assistant drove him home, and a couple reporters even followed him to his home. Finally, in this big mansion where he lived on the outskirts of town, he got inside and there his wife was there and she had a big smile on her face. And she congratulated him too and said, dear, you were marvelous, you won the case. And she was just beaming because of course, she was a part of his glory. She felt that she was somebody too. Her husband was this this most famous lawyer in the world. So they had dinner together. He retired back to his study just to be quiet for a little minute, about a while. It had been a very busy day all day long. So as he was sitting there just sort of idly going over some papers, he, he felt a pain in his side. And he didn't notice too much. He was busy with other things. And he was still on top of the world with the enormous ex excitement of the day. So he sat there and the pain increased. He thought maybe it'd go away if he ignored it, but it didn't. So the pain increased in force and got stronger and stronger until he, oh, he, he forgot all about his fame as a lawyer, all about the enormous fee that he'll be getting for it all the offers he was getting to give talks and to get honors down at the Lawyers Association and all that. He forgot all that because he had a pain in his side. He said, well, I better call a doctor. Well, I don't know any doctors. I've never had a doctor before. Everything's been fine. So then he vaguely remembered that uh, on his way driving home, just a few houses down the street, he'd seen a doctor sign or he knew a doctor lived there so he looked up the phone book and he called doctor we'll call doctor Z so he called doctor Z and he said I'm lawyer X and I'm having a pain I wonder if you could uh, come over and see me and doctor X said uh, no I'm sorry I can't see people without appointment I don't make house calls but if you'll um, call my secretary in the morning she'll make an appointment for you and you come down I'll examine you and see what's the matter so the lawyer hung up, and the next morning he went down there, and there was the doctor's office, Dr. X on the glass door in the big city building there. And the lawyer went in, and um, good heavens, he was 15th in line. 
So we sat down 15th in line and oh, he had lots of cases to take care of, lots of things to do. Besides, he was a famous man. But here he was 15th in line and then after 10 minutes, 14, another 10 minutes, 15. After a couple hours, he finally got in to see the doctor. The doctor looked him over and he said, uh, well, we'll take a couple x-rays, and which they did. And he said, no, nothing too serious. We can take care of you. Do this, do that, and uh, you'll be all right. Nothing too serious. So the lawyer went home and went back to carrying on his business. Well, the next day, the doctor, Dr. X, who had treated him, suddenly found himself world famous. His famous technique for operating on people, which cut the time in half and cut expense in half, it had finally been recognized by the medical society. Besides that, tied in it was a cure for a new, for a new cure for a disease. The doctor found himself worldwide famous. Reporters came, TV cameras were on him. He could hardly get out of his office. There were so many newsmen wanting to interview him. He went home that night and his wife beamed. I saw you on television last night. Congratulations on the marvelous contributions to medical science that you've made. And he beamed happily. He, of course, he's getting a big uh, reward for all his hard work. Money all over the place. So he went back to his study and um, went through his mail as best he could. He was so excited about everything that had happened. Phone was ringing. He told his wife, take the phone off the hook. And he idled through his letters. And there was one that looked a little strange. And up in the left corner, he didn't recognize who it was from. So he opened it up. And to his dismay, he found out he was being sued. Dear sir, we are suing you. Your property line extends 50 yards over your neighbor's property line, and we want $100,000, or we'll have to tear your house down. All of a sudden, his exultation over the day's events vanished. So he suddenly remembered the lawyer he had treated and he phoned him that night and he said, I have a legal problem. Could you come over? <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer in his best professional voice said, I'm sorry, I don't make house calls. <laughs> But if you phone my secretary in the morning, she will make an appointment for you and we can discuss your problem. So the lawyer went on over and, good heavens, he was 20th in line. The lawyer handled lots of small cases. So after a couple hours, this very, uh, very famous doctor found himself in the lawyer's office who went over the case with him and, uh, we can fix you up. We'll just do this or that and you won't have any problem. And they both looked at each other and smiled kind of oddly at uh, the same thing that it, same thing had happened to both of them. So they shook hands and now are on a first term basis. They know each other and they both went home and went back to their careers and their professions. And two or three months passed. And one night the lawyer was sitting in his office thinking about life thinking about what had happened to him. And he had a strange urge to call the doctor and invite him over for dinner. So obeying the urge, he went to consult, talked with his wife first. And then he went to the phone and he phoned uh, Dr. Eck and said, listen, uh, I'd like to talk with you about something, not medical or legal or anything. There's something else I'd like to talk to you about. Suppose you and your wife could come over for dinner tomorrow night? And the doctor said, you know, that's the oddest coincidence. I was thinking about talking to you, phoning you, and asking you to come over for dinner to my house. I wonder what's going on. So they agreed. The um, doctor came over the next night, and the wives were there, of course, and they, the four of them had a nice dinner. And afterward, the wives got together and talked about whatever they wanted to talk about. And the doctor and the lawyer went back into the study 
And it was kind of an awkward scene at the start. But they both started talking about something neither of them had ever talked about before, which was their status not as a lawyer or as a doctor, but their condition as human beings here on earth. Two men who had been born into this world, who had become a doctor and a lawyer, and then become very successful. But then a very odd thing had happened to them, and they were discussing this back and forth. And the lawyer asked the doctor, he said, I'm just wondering, uh, doctor, if you had the same experience I had, you see, I had the pain in my side, and do you know what happened to me when I had the pain in my side? One world collapsed and forced me to think about something else than law, lawsuits, money, fame, being on television, respect and admiration from anyone. Do you know, I can't tell you, doctor, but that, I can't explain it to you, but that pain in my side forced me to think about something else, and it bothers me, and it confuses me. The doctor said, you know, look, I don't know how to tell you this. I had the, the very same experience. Here I, I'm a famous doctor. I make loads of money, and everybody calls me doctor, and the nurses fawn. And I had it made, and yet, when I picked up that letter and in getting involved in all this law, which I didn't want to get involved in, you know, you know, lawyer, it forced me to see that I really was not the king of the world after all. That I, I had left something out of my life. I had made all this money and, and respect and popularity. I had made this the most important most important, the only thing in my life. And yet I saw that I am capable, was capable, of being disturbed by such a relatively small matter as this legal matter. So they kept on talking. They finally decided something. They finally decided that the crisis they had had was a message of some kind. Not anything mystical or phony, but it made them see that the way they had been living was false, was phony, that they had both, they had both lived in a world that was capable of being destroyed by something. And they both had the intelligence to see that that was no way to live. That there was something to investigate besides making more money, besides holding on to your possessions. And so guess what, ladies and gentlemen, listening to this talk and listening to this tape? They were among the thousand that went to the wise man and asked about starting down the path to truth. And I'll leave it to you as to how far they went, as to whether the lawyer quit after the first sign, or the doctor quit after the second sign, or whether they endured to the point where they knew nothing was important anymore except keeping on and on and on, dropping all the misery and all the vanity and all the sickness and all the egotism, dropping all that in favor of something that was not temporary, that was not earthly, but was eternal. And I leave that same question with you. Which do you want? You can have this world or you can have eternity. The choice is yours. Let's take a break. What aren't you abandoning 
because you don't even know that you have it in you to abandon. Don't you know, don't you understand that you're going to have to give up your surliness? You're surly, aren't you? You know, do you, how many know what the word surly means? Should we get some synonyms? Uh, rude, sour. Say it, Phyllis. Sullen. Sullen. Huh? Sullen. 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 Yes. Any more synonyms? Doer. Doer. D O U R. Yes. Sarcastic? Yes. All right, that's enough. You're going to have to give up your sarcasm, which you dearly love. You come to that sign on the path, abandon your sarcasm, and watch how you weep over the possible loss of one of your most priceless possessions. The ability to make a sarcastic remark at that driver next to you who offended you by cutting close to you or whatever. Pat, uh, I'll, excuse me please. All right, from now on, this is open discussion and questions and answers. You may contribute something of value. Seems, seems to me, Vernon, one of our parts of us that connects with that is false superiority. We believe that we believe that we see things rightly. If everyone yes. could see them that way, it yeah. would be a better place, a better world. And do you know what superiority is? Nothing more than an idea. It's not a reality. Isn't it nothing more than an idea? which will have its opposite of inferiority, and that is an equal idea. You're neither superior nor inferior. You're nothing. How about that sign? Abandon ye the belief that you are either superior or inferior. You don't even understand it. To say nothing of consciously letting it go. Because if you consciously pass that sign, a part of what you call you would disappear. It can't go beyond that sign. You can go back and keep it if you want. And go back to being excited one day, like the doctor and the lawyer were, and depress the next as they were. There's something above those two states, which is beyond the sign, and the next sign, and the next sign. Some of you are pretty far gone. I, can, I could tell by your manner during the break. You're so far gone. Listen to this prediction. Listen to this prediction. You're so far gone, you won't come back to any more classes. That's how far gone you are. I just say that as a fact, not as an insult or trying to hurt your feelings. Just a fact. And, and also giving you the only chance in the form of a jolt, if you took it properly, to cause you to come back and learn something more than what you now are. But it's a slim chance. You can, you can give yourself the chance or you can ignore it. Most people ignore it. You're just going to get more scared, you see. If you leave this class, you have made your choice. You have made your choice 
of being more of what you now are. Now let me ask you, each one of you, right around the room, what are you right now? By that I mean, real honest now, don't lie as you usually do. What is your actual state as a human being? Pretty miserable, isn't it? Pretty grotesque, isn't it? Pretty weird, isn't it? Pretty, pretty much out of control. Oh, no, excuse me. Altogether out of control, isn't it? All right. What you are right here tonight in this room, and those of you listening to this tape, if you don't come back to these truths, you will become more of what you are. There's no choice. You have made up your mind what you want. You have refused to let go of your egotism, of your sickness. So, if you're now terrified as you grow older and the lines in your face get deeper and your step goes a little slower and you feel pains in your side, then instead of simply being terrified, you will be horrified and you won't know what to do about it. You will wail, what shall I do? And you'll never hear an answer because you have decided that you want to hear the answer of your own neurosis, of your own sickness. That is where you have chosen to take your answers from and that is what you will hear and you will drive yourself crazy as you have already done up to this point of your life. You're all crazy. Every one of you, you're insane. You're insane. It's not an insult, it's a fact. You're on. Comments, questions? Murray, please. Are not these classes our road signs? Are what? Are not these classes our road signs? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. <coughs> I was just trying to think what Dr. Uh, Z would have to give up if he came to this class, for instance. Uh, doing his research, his whole life is built around his success in that. There's no facilities here he'd really have to make this easy. Give us an example of what he might have to give up, Ron. Well, the most obvious thing, he'd have to give up his whole life as a doctor. Because the research, uh, just to continue the example a bit, the facilities aren't here to... Um, do the research that he was doing previously. He'd have to give up the whole image of, of that. All right. He wouldn't have to give up his profession of being a doctor. He couldn't practice it on the same scale. I don't uh, know maybe not. Maybe not. We're saying that as a doctor, he can go ahead and uh, make his living that way. But maybe, as you have hinted, I, I suggested, he'd have to give up the grand scale of it if he was to come here. And that, that in itself is right. Yeah, sure. And guess who's going to scream the loudest? His wife. <laughs> and you know what? That miserable, wretched Dr. X. No, Z. <laughs> Let's get his name right. That cowardly, weak, little, feminine Dr. X. Z. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer X, Dr. Z. Got it. Now I can get go on with my insult. <laughs> that little panty waist, Dr. Z, is going to listen to his wife, and he deserves what he got in her. Wait a minute, I'm still boiling. <laughs> Linda. Is it possible to continue to try to make a living and be successful, have a few nice things, and still have this? Is that, is that not... I don't seem to have that. Well, it depends on how you make your living, and a lot depends on what... See, we're talking about attachments to this world. Everybody has to have money. How many of you have money? See? You have? We're talking about values. Now, does that make it clear to you? Right. Leland. Actually, what you were saying at the end about having 
this life or eternity. If we have eternity, obviously we have this life as part of the whole thing. It's just that we can't have life on the present terms that we are demanding and have it freely. That is the problem. If we're free, that is, if we have eternity, we have life freely and then we can really enjoy it. Right. Yes, please. Getting back to Dr. Z yes. and his wife. Yes. What if you don't have a wife? His wife. He'd have something else that would nag him. Yes, the pain in the side and the the lawyer and the letter, the lawsuit letter, are threatening to expose our pretense. Uh, get this our pretense of having it made. Mm -hmm. Do you mean to tell me you have it made if you can be disturbed by things like that? How about a lot smaller things than that? How many of you got scowled at today and got depressed over it? How many of you are so the scowlers? How many of you are afraid of smiling? Some of you don't have anything to smile about. <laughs> You're on. Oh, Gordon. In reality, I don't really have life anyway, do I? Like Gordon can't have life. No. I seem to grab it and freeze it. When Gordon goes, there is life. But it's not Gordon's life. Well, you said you can have this world or you can have eternity. If we want this world, then we have to take everything that's connected with it. Which is, and if, if we want this world, then obviously we want everything that is connected with this world, which is definitely opposed to eternity. Which is time. This world is time. Are we not living in time in this world? Is a physical body born and die? That's time, is it not? There's something that isn't born and that doesn't die. When you find, when you find out what that is, watch, watch how everything is different, even your physical body. How you see everything different. You look in the mirror and you say, that's Joe, or that's Joan, or that's Juan. Why are you making that mistake? Now, if you looked in the mirror and said, that is what in this temporary life is called Juan, Joan, so that you understood what you were talking about, that's a different matter. If you say that's me, you're going to be afraid of the ending of that me. Are you not? Yeah. All right. Now, another question. Real, real fast, make a connection. Can fear of anything, anytime, ever be good and right? No. Now, don't slip out of that one. Can fear of anything ever be good, true, right? The answer is no can never be right. You, you attribute, what do you attribute, what characteristics do you attribute to God, to truth? Do you attribute, it, attribute to it the wish for you to be afraid? That's the kind of a God you have? Or is that simply the kind of a God that your own confused, mixed up, self-centered self -centered self has manufactured and you are worshiping that and not truly in connection, communion with God at all? Which is it? We worship our own fears. Do you remember? Did you give a little thought to the sign that said you must give up your fear of evil? 
You take that home with you, that one in particular. You must give up your fear of evil. And don't you know that fear itself is evil? Isn't it? Is fear, look, yes or no? Is, good, is, is fear good or bad? I saw a hand somewhere. Tom. Neither men, neither men uh, displayed any humility, and they proved it by having a feeling of one-upmanship all the time. Who did? Neither, neither the doctor or the lawyer displayed any humility, and they proved this by, by their actions in, the, in each other's offices. They, they were so important that the, mm. that the 80-year-old woman should have gone behind them. Right, her. right, right. Yeah. See how, how maybe that humiliation of being 15th in line, they hated it and all that. At the same time, that was part of the lesson that was trying to get through to them, wasn't it? You're the great lawyer, but five minutes later, you're nobody. Something to think about, right? It's very good to be 15th in line. It's better to be 30th in line. And when you get to be 50th in line, then you'll really see what you're like. Uh, was that Lorraine? As, as long as we identify with anything, we're going to be haunted by the opposite. Correct. Correct. Which both of the gentlemen found out about, didn't they? They were in glory one day, next night, all gone. Victims of their own illusions. Little yapping people, little yapping reporters, little yapping uh, cameramen, little yapping little old men and little young men and ladies crowding around. You've got one minute of glory, then they're off for their hamburger. I've forgotten all about you. I'm somewhat confused here about this business of fear. It says in the Bible that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, what is this you're telling us that fear is not good? I have no idea who wrote that or why they wrote it. <laughs> I'm here now. Perhaps seeing my fear of truth would be a better place to start. Seeing your fear what of truth would be the place to start. Yes, right, right. And Frank's real nature can never fear truth. Only Frank the phony can fear the truth. Because Frank the phony wants to remain the tyrant over your life. So to you new people who won't be back, I'll say it now, goodbye. <laughs> I won't wish you good luck because you're going to have all bad luck. That's right. I'm serious. This is what you've asked for. You want your lying friends. You, you want to believe in your sister more than you want to believe in truth. You want to believe in that lying preacher when you were a girl. Do you, don't you know that people who lie to you hate you? How stupid can you get? You're loyal to a liar who used you to keep his own falsehood in place. That's exactly what he or she did, including your parents. How dumb can you get? following someone who was leading you into the ditch. But you don't know it. Well, they were so religious. 
They were devils, and you don't even know it. Devils can disguise themselves perfectly as angels, and you don't even have brains enough to investigate to see that those wings are artificially attached, that they're not real at all. You don't even have brains enough to investigate. <coughs> Did I see a hand or something, Murray? Isn't there always a connection between fear and the opposites? Fear and opposite thoughts? Yes, but that's a long story in itself, Murray, which we've gone into many times, so we won't do it now. Alan, please. I can't. I'm not able to notice loneliness in me, but I can notice fear of the future. There's a definite connection between the two, isn't there? Say that again, please. I said I can't see that I'm lonely. You, you can't told, see. Yes, you've told us we're all lonely. Yes. I can't see it. That's right. But I can see that I'm afraid of the future. Is there a connection between fear of the future and loneliness? Yes, a very good connection. What is loneliness? Loneliness is isolation. Loneliness is your sensing that you are apart from who you really are. That's what loneliness is. And, and a thousand friends won't do anything about it because you're still lost. If you're lost in the jungle and have a thousand friends around you, you're still lost in the jungle. Your friends say, let's throw a party and have whiskey and dancing. You're still lost, right? Because you're lost in the jungle. There's also the fear, there's a certain agonized fear that this lostness will continue. So you fear the future. And the reason you, but this is a false fear because the, the state you're in is false. Suppose, suppose you get out of the party in the jungle and walked out of it and found your way back home. Could there be any fear of the future? Could there be any fear of anything at all? You'll have canceled time. The party is in time. Let's have a good time now. Yes, please. Well, uh, it implies in here that... Uh, Would you look up and speak to me, please? It implies in here that fear, uh, that a person, a difficult person in the part about handling a difficult person to view them as frightened. And uh, I've also read and believed, like from Jane Roberts, that behind all hatred is the quick stand of fear. So let's say you have a relationship where two people don't get along. And I don't really know who's the difficult person, but I would view them as that. Well, even if you understand it as fear, how do you actually handle it if you actually feel almost like you're being badgered yourself? Why do you feel badgered? Why? <laughs> Maybe because I'm afraid, I don't know. Because you have fear in you which you don't understand, correct? Huh? Right. Why, why I'll, I'll put the question to you. Why is anyone able to set you off in any way at all, make you angry, make you afraid? Why? Do you understand why? All right, let me summarize very simply because, again, it's a long story. Because there's something wrong with you. And in this class, you can see what's wrong with you and get rid of it. Then you won't be afraid of anyone or anything. What if it appears that they're afraid, though? Pardon? If it appears that they're afraid. Well, they, pro they are. If they're arguing with you or attacking you, they are afraid. But you don't see that. A person who is vicious is always afraid. Viciousness and fear go together. Uh, let me state the class rules over, please. Please raise your hand before you ask a question. Keep your questions short, clear, to the point. Don't mention the name of your favorite idolized teacher. Because we don't idolize him. Fingers relaxed, jawbone relaxed.
Pat, please. Before we began to recognize some of our fears, we didn't have any problem with it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Everybody's afraid. Trying to make what he's saying uh, to add to it. We're trying to become conscious that we have problems and have a 10,000 more than we imagine we have. And we have to have the courage to see that. Without that, you'll just live a liar and die a liar, never knowing what you missed, never knowing what you could have had. But you're so afraid. You're so afraid. You, you're so stupid. You honor the lying praise of your mother, of your father, of your husband, of your wife, of your children. You permit in your stupidity and your weakness and your cowardice, you let your best friend, in quote marks, you let that relative lead you down the path to hell. If you could see, if you could see your loving relatives as they really are, you would faint. If you could look inside them and see the devil inside them, I'm not exaggerating. I wish there's some way I could get through your thick heads. My mother was such a kindly woman. Your mother was a devil. <laughs> <clears throat> and she did her best to make you the devil that she was and your father was the same Yes, please. When, when, I, when everything else fails, I always think of the one tape that you said, there's nothing to fear outside of yourself. Yes, that's a good starting place to see your own fear. Right. Uh, Leland. We seem to have rather uh, several newcomers here tonight, and I'm sure that they may not understand necessarily, Vern, what you mean by this deviltry or leading down to hell or what this is. You might uh, go into that just a little bit yeah. to be, you know. Well, the trouble is you can't get anywhere with liars. I would ask all of you to look inside yourself and see how evil, what a devil you are, but you're, you've been, you're so used to lying about the kind of a person you are, having built up all these images of being reasonably nice, that you don't know what a devil you are. And therefore, you'll never see what a devil your mama and papa were or are, or your children are, or your best friends are. So it's very, very difficult to tell you how evil your friends are because you have to see the evil in yourself before you can begin to understand that. And that's unacceptable to you because you are such a, a nice person. You help other people. You take your child, the neighbor's child to school. That's your idea of righteousness, drive, which you hated doing anyway because you didn't have the nerve to say no. That's what a coward you are. And you have all this hatred for, for every, everyone else in your heart claiming that you love everybody. You're a devil yourself. Papa succeeded. Mama marvelously triumphed in her unconscious aim to turn you into what she was. If you have, any, if you have an ounce of decency in yourself, you will snap the pattern so that even if you have up to this point done this to your children, to your husband, to your wife, you will come here to these classes and begin to break it. And what other, 
whatever damage you have done to any human being, I don't care if you're 20 years old or 90 years old, any damage you have ever done to any other human being is forgiven instantly and forever once you understand. God forgives you totally and forever, to put it in more simple language for you. When you cease to exist as a kindly person, when you cease to exist as a kindly person, all your evil sins done by that kindly person are forgiven. You can uh, get an idea of, of what devils your mother and father are when you tell them you're not coming to get together with the family for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Joan. You said we, we have a heavy spirit. And actually, it seems that we're carrying trash that goes back hundreds and hundreds and who knows, thousands of years. It's not our own trash. We acquired it and inherited it. We've added to it through ignorance. But we're, we're carrying a tremendous load in order to get rid of it. Yeah. How about a little illustration inspired by Joan? Early in life, we go way out in the edge of the city where they have the trash, you know. There's, everyone dumps their trash out there. Huge. And we take a shovel and we put it in a wheelbarrow and we bring it home and then we personalize it. My, this is my personal trash. <laughs> Joan. By the time we get it home, it's a treasure. Yes. It's actually yeah. treasure. We that's it right, treasure. that's right. That's right. We change the name, the label on the way. Mm -hmm. When we are young and we're not conditioned yet, we look up to people who are very smooth and can tell stories and are charming. And you wish always so much to be like them. And then as time passes on a little bit, you catch on. A dull story you make more exciting when you tell it to others. And so you pick up their charm, and after you get really charming, you sometimes wonder what you got. Yeah, sure, sure. Do you suppose that any of you in this room are, st well, you tell me, are you capable of still being charmed by a charlatan? Come on now. Yes. Are you keep yes. oh, shame on you. Wake up. <laughs> Pat Frank? Pat Frank. It's getting more difficult because we're beginning to see what a charlatan we have within. Right, right. Right. I got the thought that I'm just a cancerous cell in a gigantic living thing. And if it wants to get better, I have to be uncancerous or disappear for the gigantic living thing to be well. Okay, okay. All right, I'll say it again. Maybe this is very simple language, but simple language sometimes helps. You start tonight to fight for yourself. You start to fight for your true life. Now, if you don't understand what that means, it's not necessary. You just do the best you can to try to understand what it means to fight for your true life. You've been fighting for your sickness up to this point, and look what it's got you. Fear, misery, depression, darkness, hostility. Start to fight for your true life. And the purpose of this class is to help you fight in the right way to become who you really can become, which is someone who is not that miserable little Leland or Richard or Stella or Rod. Uh, Stella... 
Could you give us a couple ideas on influence? On influences? Well, you're always influenced by people who, what am I going to say? Fill it in. No? <laughs> who appear to love you. Who match your neurosis. People who match your neurosis. Because you're in love with your own sickness. How many of us are in love with ourselves tonight? Let's find that out. Am I not marvelous? Are you not marvelous? All right, then other people who flatter that, who seem to confirm it, then become people who influence us and influence us all the way down to the marsh. Tom Leland. You summed up, you summed up what this class is about yesterday or the day before when you said that when we don't want anything, we own everything. We own the world. Yes. Yes. You can own the whole world, by the way in the right way, the right meaning of that. Um, Leland Murray. Just to point out that <clears throat> the opposite esoterically of this kind of self-love that we're talking about where I want to aggrandize myself and have you approve of me and promote me and so on and so on. The opposite of that is certainly not some neurotic absorption with ideas of myself as being unworthy and degraded and sinful and so on, which is equally nauseating right. and self-punishing. I think that was clear. Fine. Who was that, Murray? Yes. Getting back to influence, yeah. truth cannot be influenced. Correct, correct. It's not on the level of thought, for one thing. Thought influences thought. Are you aware how easily your train of thoughts can be influenced this way or that way? What influences it? Thoughts of the ad out there, of another person? Even your own thoughts can influence your own thoughts. When something higher influences your thought, then they are practical thoughts. I better brush my teeth. I better bake some bread for dinner. I'd better be more efficient in my life. I'd better stop lying so much. Practical spiritual thought, is it not? You're playing it safe, every one of you. You're playing it safe. You're determined not to get hurt. Look what a ridiculous statement you just made. You're determined not to get hurt. You're already hurt. I'm not going to let you hurt me. The very saying of that, and you're hurting yourself. The very fear of getting hurt is the hurt. Gordon, was that you? No. Who was that, please? Uh, Pat. Brian, just watching our own vagabond thoughts, our own wandering thoughts here during this meeting, mm -hmm. it's so simple to see that we are neurotic. We are full of fear, pretense, right here. Are you aware that just tonight, for example, are you aware of your own thoughts to the extent that you're aware of how you have felt f intimidated, threatened, frightened by the truth you've heard here tonight? Have you felt frightened by what you've heard here tonight? Let me tell you that only the dark parts of you felt afraid, not who you really are. Try to see that. Try to understand that so that you don't identify with the dark parts that are afraid of what you've heard here tonight, which went on to a, a much, much deeper degree than any of you are aware of. All right, begin to see it. Begin to see the, the tension, the nervousness, the resistance against the truth that is trying to get through our thick heads. 
that awareness of that, of your resistance, is the breaking down of the resistance. We've got a few more minutes. Your signpost, drop your fear of evil, is the non-identification. That is, as Pat says, well, obviously, here we are in pretty sad shape. The only way that we can go beyond that is not to be afraid of it, not to identify with it. Yes, yes, well said. <clears throat> So what are you going to do with what you've heard tonight, all of you, both those of you who are new and those you've been here before? What are you going to do with what you've heard tonight? Go ahead, Stone. I'm going to pray that I can see more with my eyes and hear more with my ears. Your inner eyes, inner ears? Okay, fine. Back to a point on human relations, because I know how close it comes to all of us. Think of someone that you're afraid of, a human being. Who is it? You don't have to tell us, but tell yourself. Someone that you're afraid of. I am telling you that if you will cease to love that reaction of fear, and that per I don't care who it is, anybody on earth, if you will cease to love and understand what it means to cease to love your fear, <clears throat> their fearful reaction of that person, you can be free of him totally because you're not tied to him at all. You're not tied to her at all. You're tied to your own misconceptions of what you are all about and of what life is all about. When you understand that, you won't be afraid. It's, you ladies... You ladies, I know, I, both sides suffer, I know that. But I know how you ladies suffer from the fear of a man. And I order you to stop it. This class will teach you to stop being afraid of any man, a relative, a husband, anyone. And I order you to stop it. When you, for one thing, when you fear a man, you only increase his neurotic behavior towards you. Because he's getting a kick out of being superior to you. He loves to see the glisten in your eyes when he makes even that small remark. He's watching for that glisten of the first of tears. And that psychopath gets a thrill out of that. And you or feeding him. Shame on you. Do better than that. Do something different than that. Begin to understand these things we're talking about so that you're free not only of him but of everyone on earth because you're free of yourself. And this class will show you how to do that. You don't have to be afraid of any man of any woman. I'm telling you that. Good night.